Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, Harvard University, the Kennedy School of Government, or any other agency of the U.S. government or agencies with which our guests may be affiliated. So in this episode, our broadcast is going to um, continue its focus on the war in Ukraine, but we're also covering some other issues that we've uh, tried to highlight in that effort as well. And we have here Dr. Dara K. Cohen, who will discuss issues of wartime sexual violence, what's currently known about sexual violence uh, from Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, and some future considerations to look for. So Dr. Cohen is a political scientist and professor of public policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Her research and teaching interests include the causes and consequences of civil war and other forms of political violence, gender and conflict, and qualitative and mixed research methods. Her award-winning first book, Rape During Civil War, from Cornell University Press in 2016, examines the variation in the use of rape during recent civil conflicts. Cohen's other research on conflict-related sexual violence includes a study of women perpetrators, an examination of sexual violence by pro-government militias, and an analysis of the politics of human rights advocacy on issues of conflict-related sexual violence. Along with Professor, excuse me, Professor uh, Raghild Nordas and Dr. Robert U. Nagel, Cohen co-directs the Sexual Violence and Armed Conflict Data Project, a publicly available data resource on sexual violence perpetrated by armed groups in all conflicts since 1989. She received her PhD in political science from Stanford University and an AB in political science and philosophy from Brown University. She served as a paralegal in the Outstanding Scholars Program in the Counterterrorism Section of the U.S. Department of Justice from 2001 to 2003. And prior to joining the Kennedy School, she was an assistant professor at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. So, Dr. Cohen, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, we're very grateful for your time here today and looking forward to your presentation. And I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Major Brown. And thank you to those in the audience who are joining us today. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you. As Major Brown suggested, I am an expert on wartime sexual violence, but I just want to say at the outset that I um, am not an expert on Ukraine or that region of the world. So I just wanted to offer that caveat <laughs> as we get started. What I'm hoping to do today is to provide some context for what we uh, think to be happening based on reporting coming out of Ukraine. Um, and so the title of my talk is Wartime Sexual Violence, Yesterday, Ukraine, and Tomorrow. Uh, and thanks again for, for having me. So, oops, let's see if we can get this to work. All right, so I thought I would just get started um, with um, a little outline of where I hope to go today. Uh, first, I wanted just to talk about definitions. What do we mean when we say conflict-related sexual violence? Um, it's not as obvious as it may seem, so I wanted just to present a little bit about um, how I define it, uh, and um, then we can go from there. Uh, and then I was going to organize my comments uh, in line with the title of the talk. So first focusing on yesterday, which is to say, what do we know about patterns of when, where, and by whom wartime sexual violence has occurred in recent decades? I'll then turn to the issue of Ukraine uh, and say what we know about some patterns about what's occurring right now in Ukraine. and kind of my perspective on what these patterns suggest about the motivations. How do we understand the violence um, that's currently unfolding in, in Ukraine? What does um, what do our theories and um, uh, uh, kind of arguments about past cases suggest about how we might understand and make sense of Ukraine? Um, and then finally, I'll say a little bit about the future, about tomorrow, um, and what we might expect for the future of wartime sexual violence, given what has happened. Um, in the past. All right. So um, first, just to turn briefly to definitions, um, what do we mean by conflict-related sexual violence? Um, 
Apologies if you can hear that noise in the background. The Kennedy School is currently undergoing some renovations. So there's some drilling in my ceiling. Um, so what do we mean by conflict-related sexual violence? Um, well, there is no standard kind of widely accepted definition among scholars of this problem, right? My colleagues uh, have defined sexual violence in their own work to range from something like insults or humiliation um, all the way through to acts of very brutal violence. Um, and so there can be, sexual violence can be a, a very broad umbrella, a very broad category, um, which I think can make it a little bit frustrating to study because the accumulation of knowledge is difficult if we don't have a kind of standard definition. So to kind of deal with that problem in the sexual violence and armed conflict data project that uh, Major Brown mentioned that I've been involved in co-directing for about the past 10 years, um, we build on the International Criminal Court's definition to include acts of violence. So we kind of set aside insults or um, humiliation that doesn't include acts of violence and include um, seven acts of violence um, that are um, rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, forced sterilization, and forced abortion sexual mutilation and sexual torture. And all of these, of course, have their own um, sub definitions as well. But that's what we're looking for when we are coding acts of sexual violence for our data project. Um, some important features of how we define it or how I've defined it in, in my research is that the definition is essentially silent on the sex and gender of the victims and perpetrators. So we know that there are many um, victims of sexual violence who are men, um, despite often our assumptions that sexual violence kind of only affects women, that's not true. Um, and there also are perpetrators of all sexes and genders. So there, we know, for example, in some of the cases where I've done my own field work, that there are women who are perpetrators of sexual violence. Uh, and so our definition includes kind of the full gamut of victims and perpetrators. Um, we also code, as I mentioned earlier, actions that involve direct force or direct acts of physical violence. And so we don't include things in our study and, uh, about verbal sexual harassment, for example, or verbal humiliation, although that may happen in some cases on a large scale, but we, we don't code that, we code um, physical violence. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to say that another Another aspect of the definition of conflict-related sexual violence is that conflict-related itself is highly contested. What does it mean for something to be conflict-related? Um, and so we've defined it in a somewhat narrow way in how we collect our data, um, which is to say these forms of violence perpetrated by armed actors during wartime. But you know, there are lots of other categories of groups and people who may be um, perpetrating sexual violence in war, around war, um, and that can include, you know, civilians who are taking advantage of the kind of chaos of war to um, perpetrate sexual violence. It can include um, intimate partner violence, um, say, by soldiers who um, are abusing their partners. Um, and it can also include the period of what we might call post-war, right, when at least according to political science data sets, the conflict is over, but armed groups are still perpetrating acts of violence, um, uh, including acts of sexual violence, uh, such as rape. Uh, so I just wanted to, su to, to suggest that the conflict relatedness of violence is also contested, but we've tried to um, define it in a somewhat limited way in order to make it tractable for our data project. So we have an ongoing data collection project, which we are currently using our um, summer break to update through the current year. But right now the publicly released data goes through 2019. Um, and uh, it's available for, um, for download if, if you're interested in looking at um, some of the data that we have. But we can see that there have been reports of conflict-related sexual violence um, 
in all uh, conflicts, um, and, well, in all conflict years, I should say, since we started collecting these data um, since 1989. But it's also not present in every conflict and not every conflict actor perpetrates sexual violence. And so that's, I think, a really important point to start out with is it's, it's not ubiquitous, despite the way that we sometimes talk about sexual violence in, in wartime. Um, so I want to just quickly go through some of the this, these important sources of variation. The fact that it's not ubiquitous um, in wartime is actually really important, both to our understanding of how to approach this from a policy perspective, and also how social scientists study wartime rape and other forms of sexual violence. The fact of variation provides us with a lot of leverage in order to be able to develop hypotheses that explain these patterns and, and then to test them. Um, so, some facts that we know, some empirical patterns about how wartime rape and other forms of sexual violence have taken place in recent conflicts. Um, first, as I've already said, it's not ubiquitous, it does not happen in every war. And I think, importantly, it also doesn't happen by every armed group, even in wars that we sometimes call mass rape wars, right? Um, this, I think, is a really important point because it allows us to I think focus our scholarly attention on the armed group itself, right? So I think the important question that scholars can ask is not why was there so much sexual violence in the Sierra Leone Civil War, for example, but not in the El Salvador Civil War? Um, that is an interesting question potentially, but I think the even more interesting and important question is why even within the mass rape war of, of Sierra Leone, some armed groups committed rape and others really never did. Uh, and that variation, I think, can shed a lot of light on how we understand sexual violence. Um, I also want to say it happens in all types of wars. Uh, it happens in ethnic conflicts, it happens in non-ethnic conflicts, in secessionist wars, in wars that are characterized by genocide. And none of these particular types of wars are systematically correlated with mass rape. Right, so we can't say that all genocides feature mass rape or all ethnic wars have um, uh, large amounts of sexual violence. Um, none of these are systematically correlated. We see acts of sexual violence really across all of these different kinds of wars. Um, it's also not limited to a particular region of the world, right? We often think, um, I think in a lot of the policy discourse around sexual violence, um, at least until recently, that Maybe um, wars in sub-Saharan Africa are particularly likely to be characterized by sexual violence. That's not true, right? We see sexual violence all around the world um, in every region of the world. Uh, another important pattern that I think is counter to a lot of our conventional wisdom is that state forces, representatives of state actors, are more likely to be reported as perpetrators of sexual violence than are rebels or pro-government militias. Um, and further, a lot of the reported um, sexual violence by states happens in the context of detention. I think another thing that's not on this slide that's an important thing to, to also realize and complicates our picture of some of the conventional wisdom around sexual violence is that many of the folks who are in detention in the context of wartime are men and boys, right? So it's as I've already kind of suggested, there's lots of variation in terms of who is victimized by sexual violence, and that includes men and boys in addition to women and girls. Uh, this is my next point here. Um, we, we know that there are victims and perpetrators of all sexes and genders. Um, and this is particularly true when we move away from defining sexual violence as only rape, and we think about that broader context of sexual violence that I listed on the first slide. Um, some of the problems with understanding where sexual violence has occurred in the recent past is how um, we talk about it, how we define it. And so I, I have a colleague who um, named Michelle Leiby, who is a scholar who went back to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reports, the narratives that were offered to the Truth and Reconciliation Reconciliation Commission in Peru, um, and she kind of reread the original narratives to try to understand how sexual violence is described in Spanish in Peru. Um, and once you reread the original narratives, many more vic male victims of sexual violence emerge, right? Um, often because sexual violence, when it's experienced by men, is sometimes called 
torture um, rather than, say, rape if the very same act of violence were to occur against a female victim. And so just the way we talk about rape and other forms of sexual violence can vary by the sex and gender of the victim. And that, that complicates our understanding of who is victimized. Um, we also know that I want, this is a bit of a self critique as well. Um, and a critique of the way that the sexual violence and armed conflict project, for example, has defined conflict related sexual violence. But we know that even in the context of um, where we know there to be mass rape, for example, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, um, most people who are experiencing rape and other forms of sexual violence are not experiencing it at the hands of armed actors. They're experiencing it at the hands of their intimate partners. So even in the context of um, a conflict related region like the Eastern DRC, when scholars went in to survey those communities, there are lots of people who are reporting rape at the hands of armed actors, but that is dwarfed by the number of people who are reporting rape at the hands of their intimate partners. So that's, again, a bit of a self critique in terms of how we think about conflict related sexual violence. It's much broader than only the sexual violence that's being perpetrated by armed actors. Um, so how do we explain some of these empirical patterns of um, wartime rape and other forms of sexual violence? I want to just highlight kind of two older arguments that we often um, have uh, talked about in some of the at least scholarly literature. Um, and then I'm going to talk about an, emer an em emerging argument that I think is um, has has maybe more empirical support. So. The first of the older arguments is an argument that is often called opportunity, right? The idea here is that there is the fog of war, the chaos of war. We have often sort of armed young men who in many of the civil war contexts that I study um, are not necessarily in kind of highly disciplined armed forces, often um, are using you know, drugs and alcohol. And of course, the argument goes, that we see a lot of atrocities, abuse of civilians and sexual violence. And I wanna just note that the kind of kernel at the heart of the opportunity argument is a lot of assumptions about kind of men's unbridled uh, sexual needs, right? That are being met through um, the rape of civilians um, and other forms of sexual violence um, in the kind of chaos of, of conflict. So it's an opportunity argument. It's kind of about uh, private incentives, right? For committing sexual violence. Um, a second sort of older argument is an argument about strategy, right? And here the argument is that it's not opportunity or private motivations, but rather it's a strategy of war, a tool of war, right? And this is kind of, I think, the dominant narrative right now in the policy discourse. And I do want to note that it's the result of a lot of hard work by feminist activists and advocates over many years to draw attention to this issue, right? To, br to bring this issue out of a kind of opportunism argument, a private motivations argument, and into the realm of high politics and discussion of military strategy. Um, and I think it's been a very effective framing for this issue, but it's problematic in a number of ways, right? Um, the strategy argument often, I think, assumes either implicitly or explicitly that rape is being ordered from the top down by, in some cases, I think in our imagination, a kind of nefarious commander who understands the power of rape um, in the context of war, right? And so we see a framing like this, um, this, this Amnesty International billboard that's presented here on the slide, the idea that rape is cheaper than bullets, it's highly effective as a tool to terrorize, humiliate, and demoralize. I think all of those things are true, but whether in fact sexual violence and, and rape are systematically used as a strategy, I think um, is not really drawn out, borne out in the, in, in the, in the data, right? For, for example, we don't have a lot of evidence that rape is ordered from the top down. <laughs> um, there's, there's vanishingly rare evidence, in fact, that um, rape is sort of ordered from the top down in many cases where we see mass rape during wartime. And I think that's really important for us to, to recognize that rape can happen on a massive scale, even in the absence of direct orders, 
Um, so neither of these arguments, the opportunity argument or the strategy argument, I think explains the variation that I presented on the previous slide. Like opportunity exists in every wartime context, and yet rape is, I think, um, mercifully, relatively rare as a form of, at least mass rape, is relatively rare as a form of violence that we observe in the context of war. So opportunity is everywhere, rape is rare. Strategy, I think, um, you know, there are costs to using um, rape as a tool of war, of course, um, but also it doesn't, um, again, we don't have a lot of evidence when we actually talk to combatants, um, and, and to victims and survivors that rape is actually being used in many cases as a kind of strategy or tool. I think in some ways that gives um, too much credit to some of the, um, the, the commanders that we see on the ground in terms of thinking about rape as a strategy. So instead, I put myself in this third category, um, along with a number of other scholars um, who are working on this issue right now, this kind of newer emerging argument where we might think of um, rape as what my colleague at Yale, Professor Elizabeth Wood, has termed a practice of war, right? And a practice of war is something that is not directly ordered by the command, um, but is tolerated, right, from the top. Uh, so it's not something as sort of neatly organized by the from the top down, but is rather something that is, we're more likely to observe it as being innovated from the bottom up. Uh, what I end up arguing in my first book, um, shown here on the screen, called Rape During Civil War, is that um, in many of the contexts that, many of the Civil War contexts that I've studied, rape is, rape in particular, I want to point out, I don't study all of the seven forms of sexual violence in my book. I really look at, primarily at rape. Um, rape, I argue, is often innovated from below to help resolve problems of cohesion, particularly within armed groups that have recruited their fighters through force or through other forms of um, abduction, right? Those are groups that tend to suffer from very severe problems of low cohesion. Um, and those problems of low cohesion are at least partially resolved by, um, by sexual violence, by rape, and in particular by multiple perpetrator rape, by gang rape. One of the kind of puzzles that emerges when we look at reports of rape during wartime is that the, um, the incidence of gang rape in particular just is enormous, right? And that's true even in contexts where we know um, rape to be very common in the peacetime context. So something like 70, 80, 90% of reports of rape during wartime or gang rape. So what I end up arguing in my book is that an, uh, a theory of rape during wartime really has to account for the shift from uh, into uh, a realm of um, the, the prominence of gang rape as a form of rape during war. Um, and the the, the reason that I think I draw on a lot of other literature from other disciplines, including criminology, um, which looks at perpetrators of gang rape. Um, and so we know that um, gang rape can serve as essentially a form of communication between the perpetrators of that particular act and can help create social bonds between those perpetrators. And importantly, also come, drawing from some research from psychology, we know that when masculinity is threatened, in the way that we can assume that it is, or that um, I've also done research with um, interviews with ex-combatants in a number of different post-war contexts, when one is um, abducted and forced to join an armed group, that is a, a threat to one's masculinity. Um, and one way of recovering a uh, from a threat to masculinity, we know from some research in psychology, is to perform a public act of violence. And in particular, I think a public act of sexual violence can help to sort of um, uh, deal with, I think, the threat to masculinity that has been experienced through the process of abduction. So that's the kind of main argument from my book. And I think it does help us resolve some of the um, puzzles that emerge from some of those empirical patterns that appeared on the previous slide. Um, I'm happy to talk in Q&A about the research that I did for my book, but I just wanted to highlight that I did um, field work in three post-conflict contexts, 
uh, and did the majority of my research was focused on interviews with ex-combatants, trying to understand how sexual violence um, was essentially tolerated um, in each of those different contexts, or whether it was, you know, punished. How how folks who were involved in the armed groups that were perpetrating it um, understood it. All right, I'm going to shift gears now to talk in particular about Ukraine. Um, so. Again, I want to just be careful to say that I am not an expert and I don't have any particular special insight into reports of sexual violence in Ukraine beyond what has been widely reported in the news media. Um, but it's you know a topic that I've followed closely in the last few months. Um, and so I wanted to kind of highlight a few patterns that have emerged in these public reports of patterns of sexual violence. Um, the first is that there have been a wide variety of forms that have been reported um, and unlike in many of the other conflict contexts that I have studied, even in recent conflicts, we have kind of unprecedented real-time information that's emerging from the Ukraine context, right? We have victims and survivors, witnesses, human rights organizations, women's rights organizations, um, uh, lawmakers on the ground who are providing real time information as the conflict is unfolding. Um, and I also wanted just, just to highlight part of the reason we have that is just an immense amount of courage and bravery on the part of victims and survivors of sexual violence um, who are coming forward despite uh, the incredible risks that they face um, in the ongoing conflict context. So. Some of the reported forms that have emerged include gang rape, which, as I've already suggested, is comprises often um, one of the most um, commonly reported forms of, of sexual violence in wartime. We also have reports of rape at gunpoint, victims of all ages. Um, ch child victims, elderly victims. We have reports of rape in front of victims' children, and then other forms of non-rape um, sexual violence, including torture and sexual mutilation. Um, one of the atrocities that emerged from Bucha in particular was a very disturbing report about um, 25 women and girls who had been held captive in a basement for a period of days um, or weeks, and nine of whom were reported to be pregnant um, at the end of that. Um, so there, there is also some suggestive reports of sexual slavery, right? Not just kind of one-off um, acts of violence, but repeated acts of violence in some cases. Um, I do want to highlight that it's still really, because this is such... Um, uh, uh, emerging context, um, it's very unclear how widespread um, these types of atrocities are, or even really how common and widespread sexual violence is. Um, as of June 3rd, a few weeks ago, um, the human rights monitoring team of the UNHCR uh, reported to the United Nations that they had reports of 124 acts, but they also reported that these acts were rising fast. And as is the case in many conflict contexts, it's very likely that this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, however, I do want to say that we're, this is just such an unclear context right now um, in terms of the number of cases and how widespread this actually is. Um, other kind of broader patterns relating to sexual violence and the current context is that we know there is, based on some of the data that we have collected through the Sexual Violence in Armed Conflict, uh, data project that there is a recent history for Russia and Russian backed forces in Chechnya and Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Um, I wanted to highlight here just one example from um, Donbas, for example. Uh, this, this is an example that comes from the 2017 U.S. State Department Human Rights um, Country Reports. The U.S. State Department issues annual reports on human rights abuses for every country in the world. I should say every country in the world except for the United States. Um, and many uh, scholars who, like myself who use kind of um, quantitative data to study human rights abuses rely on the State Department as one of our main sources. So in this particular case, I do want to highlight that we have um, reports of 
both men and women. And this is according to um, the State Department got its information from a human rights coalition based in the Donbas region. But they noted that within detention facilities, Ru Russian led forces had reported rape, attempted rape, forced nudity, sterilization, and sexual torture against both men and women. Um, so we know that was happening, for example, in 2017. And there are many re such similar reports from other contexts um, in the region. Um, so reflecting for a moment just on some of the uh, scholarly theories that we have about when and why sexual violence happens, I wanted to highlight a few red flags that both me and some of my colleagues who study sexual violence in wartime um, think are concerning about the Ukraine context, uh, con the, the Ukraine conflict context, and reasons that I think many of us are quite concerned, even though right now there are limited uh, official reports, uh, that there may be many more uh, reports yet to come. Right? The first is this kind of broader context that we know that state actors uh, in general, comprise the majority of perpetrators of uh, conflict conflict related sexual violence. The same may be true in the current Ukraine con context. Um, the second is coming coming out of some of my research is that there seem to be large numbers of conscripts and in some cases forced recruits. Right, there are reports of young men who have been literally forced at gunpoint, um, beaten and forced to join um, Russian led forces. And so those that is a particular red flag for sexual violence um, that I have argued uh, we've seen in other kind of civil war context. This is, of course, is not a civil war, but we've seen in other civil war contexts in the uh, in my book research, for example. Um, we have other uh, research by some of my colleagues. Austin Doctor uh, is a, a colleague of mine at the University of Nebraska who has argued that the presence of foreign fighters, as we have observed in this conflict context, is uh, can be a sign uh, that there are um, going to be uh, an uptick in atrocities. And in particular, he has shown that their um, foreign fighters are associated with an uptick in sexual violence, in part for some of the same reasons that I presented earlier, that sexual violence and especially gang rape can be used to create social bonds. Um, we know that restraint in the use of sexual violence is often correlated with what with, um, my, my colleague, uh, Professor Amelia Hoover-Green at Drexel University has called political education. Um, so armed groups that invest in making sure that their fighters understand the purpose of why they're fighting um, are more likely to use restraint when it comes to civilian atrocities and civilian victimization. And we have evidence of the opposite, really, in this particular case, that there are um, Russian fighters who don't understand really what they're fighting for, don't understand the context of the conflict, and that may be a sort of red flag for um, an uptick in uh, atrocities, and in particular sexual atrocities. Um, and then we have also um, a kind of broader context where we Putin has used um, what we might think of as rape rhetoric for a while now when it comes to talking about Ukraine, talking about President Zelensky, um, including one particular joke that got a lot of media coverage um, in February of this past year, uh, which is highlighted on the screen here, this, this kind of quote unquote joke about um, it's your duty, my beauty, right? About marital, marital rape. And so th the reason I'm highlighting that is it's suggestive of a kind of tolerance or even potentially encouragement of the use of sexual violence by, um, by Russian forces. So what do we know about why or what can we kind of um, surmise with the limited evidence that we currently have about why sexual violence is taking place right now in Ukraine? What might some of the motivations be? And again, I just want to say that these are guesses, right, um, based on some of the evidence that has started to emerge. But you know, one guess, and this is counter to what I was suggesting earlier about some of the arguments I've made in some of my work, is that this may actually be a case where there is um, suggestive evidence of at least 
knowledge of and tolerance for sexual violence and possibly also um, orders from the top down, right? Again, uh, evidence is, is emerging slowly, um, but we have stories like um, some of the atrocities that were reported in the New York Times. The New York Times did this very disturbing story called Bucha's Month of Terror, which came out in April um, of this past year. Uh, it was a photo essay combined with just a, a large set of, um, uh, of, of cases of atrocities. But one of the atrocities that I found particular, particularly disturbing was this example where um, a family returned home to their house to find a woman who, a, a body of a woman who had clearly been raped, but her body was strewn with condoms and condom wrappers. Um, and the reason I find this particularly disturbing is that it suggests counter to what we might think would happen in a case of opportunism or sort of a few bad apples, um, there's really a, a, a lack of kind of hiding what happened. And in fact, leaving behind evidence for the family to discover when they return to their house. Um, so this, I think, is suggestive of some kind of weapon of war motivation, uh, um, which may be happening in the particular conflict context. Um, there's also some very disturbing evidence of potentially genocidal motivations, right? That kind of case of the women who were held in the basement in Bucha until, um, and, and uh, a subset of them became pregnant. Um, they reported hearing some very disturbing things. Uh, and so we have here a quotation, which I'm drawing from the BBC from this past April for one of um, Ukraine's ombudsman for human rights who said that these um, women reported that they were told by their captors that they would be raped until the point that they wouldn't want to have sexual contact with anyone else and to prevent them from having Ukrainian children. Uh, so scholars of genocide and in particular genocidal sexual violence will often study the utterances of perpetrators in order to understand motivations for the violence. And so this kind of utterance is similar to the kinds of things that we've seen in other cases of genocidal violence, for example, um, in the Bosnian conflict context. Um, so those are two, I think, kind of concerning signs for other sources of motivations in the Ukraine context. Um, I'll close out here by thinking a little bit about um, tomorrow. Uh, and this is, again, beyond the context of the Ukraine contact conflict in particular. Uh, and hopefully maybe end on a little bit of um, some good news. Um, so one of the things that we've tried to do in the Sexual Violence and Armed Conflict Data Project is to you know, look at reports of sexual violence by both armed actors and rebel actors. So some of the, I think, hopeful news that we've noted in the more recent years, and again, I want to, I want to highlight that our most recent year that is publicly released is 2019. So uh, we'll hope, we're hoping by the end of the summer to release through 2021. But we have noted in the handful of the most recent years that there have been a decline in reports of state actors as perpetrators, as reported perpetrators of sexual violence relative to, you know, the, the broad um, uh, patterns of the past three decades or so. Um, and I think it's important to say here that this is not, uh, I think, a vestige of potential reporting biases. If anything, the more recent years of, in our data set are um, better reported than some of the earlier years. Sexual violence is something that we as a policy community, um, as scholars, are paying much more attention to now than we did, say, 30 years ago. Um, and so we have every expectation that reporting has improved. And so um, the fact that there is a decline in reports of state actors, I think, is suggestive that this may be, in fact, um, evidence of an actual decline in uh, reporting of state perpetrators. I, this is paired with a bit of bad news, which we, is that we don't see a similar decline in reports of sexual violence by rebel groups, by non-state actors. 
But the hopeful aspect here, I think, is that there has been a great deal of policy interest, advocacy, activism around issues of conflict related sexual violence, um, and in particular, a focus on naming and shaming of state uh, perpetrators of wartime rape and other forms of sexual violence. Uh, and scholars have shown that in some cases, uh, naming and shaming can be very effective. Right. Uh, and so um, when states care about their reputation, and that is a big um, conditional statement, um, we know that there is some evidence that they uh, draw down their use of atrocities, potentially including acts of sexual violence. And again, I want to highlight that this is some cases. Um, so not every state is similarly concerned about their reputation. Um, but in some cases they are, and so this may explain some of the decline in reports of state actors. Um, finally, I, I wanna say that one sort of aspect of the current crisis in Ukraine that I have found particularly hopeful is that there has been, I think, a reignited interest in this issue. Um, it's, it tends to be an issue that gets little bursts of interest over time. Um, and right now, in part because of the courage and bravery of folks on the ground um, and victims and survivors and witnesses in Ukraine, it's a topic that has re-entered uh, the news media and re-entered um, our sort of collective understanding of what happens in the conflict context. And so there has been, I think, a sort of renewed hope and also a renewed effort towards collecting evidence that maybe could be used uh, in efforts towards justice and accountability in this particular case. So um, I will end there. Um, oops. <laughs> Have some extra slides. I will end there and just uh, say thank you again for inviting me to participate. And I look forward to to your questions and comments. All right, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. And uh, yeah, to our audience, if you uh, have some questions, go ahead and start throwing them into the chat here on WebEx. Uh, but I do have a couple to kind of start things going here. Um, so I I was actually I, I found um, was surprised myself when you were talking about in sort of the, the most conflict riven regions where you had more instances of rape from intimate partners than from the armed actors who were prevalent in that that battle space so what why is that it would i i if if there's a saturation of armed um armed actors running around and a potentially large vulnerable population well, why is it the intimate partners who were who are the objects and not necessarily the the vulnerable population yeah, so just to be clear about th that particular finding, um, it's not that, um, I, I think the, the important thing to recognize is that the intimate part, sexual violence by intimate partners is extremely common sort of universally, right? Um, and so the my, my argument there was that um, even in contexts where sexual violence um, by armed actors is what we might consider to be on a massive scale, like it was in the context of Eastern DRC, it's still the case that um, sexual violence by intimate partners uh, is much, much more common. So it's not necessarily that the armed actors in that space are more likely to commit sexual violence against their own intimate partners. But it's just looking at the prevalence of who is victimized, even in cases where we know sexual violence to be happening on a massive scale, um, most people in the, in the conflict affected area are not being um, sexually violated by armed actors. They're being sexually violated by their intimate partners. Okay, I, yeah, no, thanks for, for explaining that. And, and I guess I, I could see that that would make sense if you're in an inherently, you know, violent and uncertain environment that just that potentially opens up the uh, the possibility of that spilling over into, you know, if, if there's lack of civil order, there's lack of restraints on that sort of behavior, sort of just in general. Absolutely. And it's also a critique of the policy focus, right? So even in contexts where there is a lot of policy attention to wartime rape, like Eastern DRC, right, which has often 
um, somewhat unfortunately been been called the quote rape capital of the world, or at, at least it was um, a, a while ago when um, sexual violence was at its peak there. Um, even in that kind of context with so much um, policy focus being focused on the sexual violence at the hands of armed actors still right there there was kind of this ignored pocket of um of sexual violence by intimate partners so it's it's um that kind of pattern is has often been used by some of my colleagues to be a kind of critique of what some people think is the overfocus on wartime sexual violence to the detriment of not looking at the broader picture of sexual violence writ large all right yeah no thank you the next question i have is actually it's uh not I guess not so much a question about the presentation, but more to sort of get your thoughts on something which I, I had read in the context of the invasion of Ukraine. And I, I think it had, it had been reported relatively early on, but it was in the midst of, uh, you know, there were a lot of intercepted phone conversations between, you know, Russian soldiers and either their commanders or folks back home. And that kind of goes into the unprecedented level of data you talked about. It also raises some interesting questions about the operational security of Russian networks, but that's a separate, separate problem. Um, to talk about. But one of these intercepted conversations was between a Russian soldier and his wife, and it was kind of chilling. Uh, and you're sort of nodding your head. I think you know, know where I'm going. But she was basically giving him permission to rape Ukrainian women. And she had said, just don't tell me and wear protection. So my question to you is, what what kind of mindset or, or mentality does does this suggest about, you know, not just the Russian soldiers in Ukraine, but maybe sort of the, the deeper mentality back in Russia among the population there in terms of how they view sexual violence on, you know, this country that was supposed to be their neighbor, right? You know, part of a common people. What does it suggest about what, what mindset is going on there? Yeah, I had seen that particular report as well. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to just... Uh, it's we're we're in such an information rich environment, but so little of the information that we have access to has been kind of um, verified, right? And so it's it's hard to know um, what we're seeing and who has created what we're seeing. But um, I do think I did see that. I also found it like like many people who who um, saw those reports found it very disturbing. Um, and I think a couple of things are important to to sort of highlight about that particular um, incident. One is that I think when we talk about rape, there sometimes can be an assumption that um, like I was saying before, that it's a form of violence by men against women and that um, it, the truth is it's so much more complicated than that, right? And so what I think that particular incident suggests is that women can be involved in encouraging as this particular incident shows where it was a wife encouraging her husband to engage in that form of violence. But I've also studied cases where there are female combatants themselves who are procuring victims, who are holding victims down, and who in some cases um, are participating in sexual violence as well. Um, to, in the case of Sierra Leone, for example, women who um, participated in um, using objects to rape victims alongside their um, their their um, uh, com combatant colleagues who were uh, raping using their bodies, and so um, it's it's much more complicated than a form of of um, violence by men against women. We see women involved in all kinds of ways. So I actually wasn't surprised in that regard to to see to to hear about a case where a woman was encouraging um, her husband to to embark on that kind of, of violence. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting to note in, I, this has been studied in the context of, um, you know, scholars are, I think are, are studying, are, are starting to study more and more about the, the um, how rape takes shape in the context of bitter ethnic violence or even acts of genocide. Um, and there's actually a lot of variation here. And so there's some genocidal contexts where rape just doesn't happen very often because um, there is such strong pollution taboos. Um, like the, the ethnic enemy is not seen as um, a, a sexual being. It's not appropriate to have sexual contact with the ethnic enemy. And so that may, for example, um, 
be somewhat of an explanation for why rape wasn't very common, um, not to say that sexual violence didn't happen at all, but why rape in particular wasn't very common um, against Jewish women um, by Nazis, right? Um, because sexual contact was, it would be polluting to, ha to, to, to rape a Jewish woman. Um, but there are other contexts where we, where there are kind of ethnic enemies where it's sexual contact isn't prohibited. And so we can think, for example, of the case of Rwanda, where there was a lot of intermarriage prior to the civil war, prior to the genocide. And so that may be kind of one partial explanation for why rape was so common during the Rwandan genocide. Um, so one, I think, somewhat untested hypothesis that's kind of kicking around among scholars, and I do want, want to credit um, uh, Professor Elizabeth Wood at Yale with, with this hypothesis, is that it may be the case where there is a lot of intermarriage um, but prior to the conflict. Those may be cases where rape is actually more likely to emerge, right? And so that may be somewhat of what we're observing in the case of the Ukraine. Right there, there are close and intimate ties, families that have um, that have relatives on both sides of this conflict. Lots of intermarriage. Um, that so that may be part of what um, why kind of rape may be um, happening in this in this particular conflict context. Um, but I, I, the final thing I'll say is that this is just a a bitter war that seems to be characterized by terrible atrocities. And so when there are incidents of mass killing, when there are, when, when the kind of prohibition on the killing and torture of civilians has eroded away, that's a context where we may be likely to see incidents of mass rape, incidents of sexual slavery. So it, it does seem kind of of a piece that um, if civilians um, on one side of the conflict are kind of accepting and encouraging forms of atrocities that we, you know, they all kind, they may all be likely to sort of occur together. Yeah, no, thank you for the, um, for expanding on that. And I, I, I agree. And, and sort of outside of this, there's, there's a lot of admittedly, you know, anecdotal evidence because we, it's very hard for us to peek behind sort of the information curtain in Russia. That's, that's one of the challenges is they've, fairly successful at shutting off information going in as well as information going out, at least for the Russian population. But yeah, there does seem to be a much bitter and, and poisonous mindset at work, which is is making these things, you know, more manifest and just more brutal on the battlefield in those instances that we do get evidence for. I got uh, one more question for you from my end. And then if we have nothing from the chat here, I think we'll, uh, we'll close it out here after this. But kind of a more general question just, you know, for you, we were talking before we started that sort of one of your first times in front of a military audience. And as I'd mentioned before, like we're getting into areas um, like this that have not been covered in a lot of our, you know, our education or training, but we're, at least on our part here at the university, we're trying to get people to think about it more because it's all, you know, it's all part of, of the battlefield, whether we want to think about it or not, it's out there. So from your end, what, what things do you think that the, you know, the military leader in the U.S. military leader, I should say, in future conflict what, what do we need to be thinking about if on a future battlefield where we potentially start seeing evidence of this happening perpetrated by, you know, the adversary? How do you how do we prepare ourselves to, you know, to address it, to try and care for the victims? You know, there there are certain, you know, higher level policy things that we have to be aware of. But for the you know, for the lower level folks at the, at the front, they don't necessarily are, are equipped to deal with that. So what, what are your thoughts or your, you know, your recommendations for how do we think about it? How do we deal with it? How do we, we don't have all the, the tools that we need to deal with it. Who should we look to to help us, help us address it? Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. I think I, in part, I want to uh, ask the question back to you because especially that last part um, in, um, because I'm also curious about um, how, you know, folks in your world are currently thinking about these issues as well. But I guess I would say, I mean, I have the incredible privilege of teaching um, students who are in the military here at the Kennedy School. And so I've learned a lot from them as well. Um, I guess I would say, I, I think some of the most important things for folks to know um, is, uh, I think when, when we imagine wartime rape, um, 
I think people often carry with them um, the conventional wisdoms that I mentioned at the outset of this talk. And so, uh, you know, rape is a form of violence by men against women. Well, that's not true. So if we're if we're trying to be aware of what wartime sexual violence might look like on the ground, um, there are likely to be all kinds of victims of sexual violence, including male victims of sexual violence, right? Um, and so to be aware of the very broad pool of, um, of civilians who may be experiencing these forms of sexual violence. Um, I also think, um, just also to highlight something that I said earlier, sexual violence can happen in contexts even without uh, direct orders from above. Right, it can happen, including on a massive scale, um, without direct orders from above. And so, um, I think that has important policy implications for folks on the ground too. I, one of the one of my frustrations, I think, is that a lot of the policy discourse on preventing sexual violence in wartime right now is focused on um, what's often called closing the impunity gap. Right, and I think that the implicit theory there is that by holding yesterday's perpetrators accountable, we will deter tomorrow's perpetrators. Um, and I think there are lots of reasons why we ought to hold yesterday's perpetrators accountable, but deterrence, I think, has very little support in the evidence. Right, um, and so. Um, I, there's so much focus right now focused uh, in, in particular on kind of justice and, and accountability as a, as a form of deterrence. Um, and so I, I think the and, and as a result, a lot of the policy efforts are kind of focused in particular on the command level. Uh, and so if if what I argue in my book is correct, really a lot of the um, sexual violence in wartime is innovated from the bottom up. And so it's not something that's going to be solved um, easily by just getting rid of the few bad apple commanders who are tolerating or ordering this, right? It's, um, it's a much broader problem, which I think also makes it a much more difficult problem to solve. Uh, and so I think being aware that it, it's, it's not ordered necessarily from the top down um, Kind of can maybe help people on the ground understand just how complicated um, wartime sexual violence um, can can actually be. Um, but I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, who are who are the kind of main actors who are <laughs> involved in helping military folks on the ground. Um, well, I yeah, I certainly was not expecting a a question to my question, um, <laughs> but um, no, I so I, I I don't have a a complete answer, but I think. Um, part of the answer is what, um, you know, one, what the uh, initially we're talking about before was the, you know, getting more women of peace and security perspectives into, you know, the educational curricula that we can control. And in fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out we have Dr. Anahid Matosian here in the audience. She was our WPS subject matter expert who was um, brought in to help Marine Corps University do precisely that. Um, so I, I I, I guess part of it is simply raising awareness that that is a factor that even needs to be considered as part of general professional military education. Um, and in, I, I'd say in some very recent interactions that we've had uh, on behalf of Marine Corps University via the Krulak Center is just learning who more of those people are, those agencies are out there that can help um, and can, can help give us answers because we don't have all those answers. Um, for example, we had um, last week we went up to the uh, not the headquarters, but the the regional office for the um, International Committee for the Red Cross for the U.S. and Canada up in D.C. to meet with their head of delegation because we had had some of their folks down earlier to talk about humanitarian issues inside of wargaming, which is something that all the schools are here are doing. Um, it's it's done across the Marine Corps and sort of varying levels of effort, um, you know, but it, like. Those are those are simulations for future conflicts, but there are a, a lot of the times they focus down on just like sort of tactical actions, like you know companies going against companies, battalions against battalions, what have you, and you have those actors on the battlefield. But you're you know you're not operating in a in a static military only environment. You're operating in you know for us it's usually in somebody else's country, which means you're operating with other people who were there, um, and so acknowledging that, that there's those other actors on the battlefield that your your military forces are going to interact with 
you know, whether you like to or not. And that being the case, that needs to be presented more in the, you know, the planning exercises, war games, et cetera, that we run. So, so part of our work for the university on the center is finding people like yourself and the Red Cross who can, you know, sort of be in the room and help it, make sure those layers are captured in those things because um, we, we need to be able to equip our, you know, our, our leaders at all levels, knowing that it's not just a military only vacuum where they're going to be going. You're, you're going to be dealing like, um, you know, you, Ukraine is one example, but if we're looking at conflict in other places too, you're going to have massive personnel, you know, population displacement. You're going to have interruption of basic civil services, destruction of civil infrastructure. Um, and that that disorder that sort of releases the shackles of civilization and creates a, a a very uncertain and dangerous environment where these things can happen and so we need to we need to start grappling with that now in our training and education um before we have you know before the first time we see it is on the battlefield because that's not the first time you want to have to be thinking about that so i I'd, I'd say in in some <laughs> to partly answer your question is this is part of that is is getting yourself and folks like uh, the Red Cross and Dr. Matosian, who's uh, got her camera on. Dr. Matosian, did you want to add anything? Hello. Um, it's so nice to meet you, Dr. Cohen. I really enjoyed your um, talk. I especially was really interested in um, the discourse analysis you did, looking at the uh, what perpetrators were saying or state actors. Um, I did something similar with Syria and Armenia, looking at who uh, what Syria was saying in terms of um, like urging refugees to come back to Syria. So if you're supportive of this state or not, that means that determines your welcome. So um, yeah, that has to do with uh, gender as well. But I don't have anything to add. Just really, really appreciate you being here, and um, I'd love to talk with you further. Really. Thank you so much. Yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Matosian. Okay, I don't I don't have any other questions for you, and I don't have anything else in the chat. So, um, Dr. Cohen, any any final closing comments or thoughts you'd like to share? <laughs> um, I just will close by saying thank you so much for, again for uh, inviting me to participate, and uh, I really appreciated the opportunity. Yeah, well, no, thank you very much again for your time, and this has been a, a very valuable uh, discussion and perspective to add into our, like I said, not just our focus on the war in Ukraine, but trying to bring in. Uh, to help our students and our community of interest understand many different dynamics of play on fields of conflict. And it's not just tactical units running around the battlefield. There's a lot more going on that we need to think about. To our uh, to our audience, thanks for joining us today. We are sort of coming into, uh, I guess we'll call it the summer lull here, lull here in the broadcast scheduling. So um, this is the last one we have planned. It's kind of going into uh, the middle of the summer months here. But you can expect us back in August. I've already got about three or four uh, broadcast episodes percolating for the uh, August month on a, on a variety of topics relating from, uh, from force design to small UASs to some other very interesting things going on inside the Marine Corps. So make sure uh, you're following us on all of our channels because we will be uh, having some great stuff coming here after the break of a few weeks. I will also note, though, that we'll probably try and get at least one more down the rabbit hole on the Russia-Ukraine war with Dr. Yuval Weber, our special mini-series focused on the war here uh, in the next couple of weeks. So give you all something to look forward to. But otherwise, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, joining us today again. And make sure you follow us for future episodes in the coming weeks. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.